everyone. My name is Nadia. I'm an intern at this gallery. Welcome to Ilham and this morning's talk, Deeper Than Indigo, Indigo with our guest speaker, Jenny Belfort-Paul. So Jenny Belfort-Paul is a research fellow at Exeter University, trustee of the Royal Geographical Society, fellow of the Royal Asiatic Society and Explorers Club, and president of UK's Association of Guilds of Weavers, Spinners, and Dyers. She has been a consultant for Indigo exhibitions, educational programs, documentary films, and promotes worldwide revivals of natural dyes. This morning, she'll be speaking on her acclaimed book, Deeper Than Indigo, which is a biography, memoir, and the reimagining of the journeys of remarkable 19th century Indigo painter, oh, planter and explorer, Thomas Machel. Jenny will speak for about 15 minutes, after which she'll take questions from the audience. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Jenny Balfour Paul. Yeah. Uh, this is amazing to be here. Thank you for coming on a wet Saturday morning. Uh, it's my first time in Kuala Lumpur. I've traveled quite widely, as you'll see, but I've never been here. So um, there's so much to explore. And I hope you enjoy the next 50 minutes or so. Um, it is actually amazing giving the talk while this exhibition is on. I hope you've all had a chance to see it. I can't probably pronounce correctly the wonderful artist. Um, Latif Mohideen? Yes? Okay. Um, because his themes here are very resonant, actually. He, um, I was really struck reading the catalogue to say he's very concerned about voluntarily leaving one's home and the familiar. And there's a word for it in Malay, which I'm not going to pronounce. And he invented his own word for um, memory and time and crossing time and crossing cultures. It could hardly be more appropriate for um, my young man, Thomas Machel. And there's a poem on the wall here that says, there is a blue sky with a different shade of blue. And the end is there is a blue island with a different shade of blue. And the poem is all about moving across time and, and, um, uh, and that kind of thing. I, think that I just feel, I went around, I was very moved when I went around the exhibition. I really linked with it. And also another thing is he's both a writer and a painter. And that's something dear to my heart and dear to the heart of Thomas Machel. Um, both of us are torn between these things. So it felt very resonant to me. And actually the opening line or well, the opening quote, of course, there's another thing. There was a talk here. Whoops, I've dropped everything. Typical. Um, there was a talk here two years ago, I think, about Tagore. And the sister of the person who gave that is in the audience. I opened my book with a quote on Tagore. By the way, before I start, please lift up your hand or tell me if I'm speaking too fast or you can't hear or whatever. D don't be polite. <laughs> so... Um, my book starts with a chapter called Meeting Thomas, um, meeting across time, let's say. Let your life lightly dance on the edges of time, like the dew on a tip of a leaf. And um, I rather like that quote, and each chapter has a quote at the top. But I had to start with Tagore, because there's a huge Bengali connection to this book. Um, and thinking about place and time, I should just a little funny anecdote when I left UK about a week ago. I went to Singapore to talk first, dear to my heart, because I'm talking to, there's a wonderful exhibition at the moment there about the major commodities of Indonesia, four of them, uh, and one of them is indigo, and there's a wonderful modern indigo installation. There was a seminar, um, and then I spoke to students at college, and I love doing that. I love speaking to the young and also working with children. So that was dear to my heart. Um, but when I left, um, of course, dear to my heart is my own grandson, because of course he's the best person in the entire world, as every grandmother says. And he's six, and he was in the car with a friend. And as I got out, and he was a rather tearful goodbye. He hates goodbyes. I hate goodbyes, too. Um, we have this policy good, that you have to make them good, because you never know whether it's going to be the last one, do you? I'm very, I really think goodbyes are important. And uh, his friend said, uh, he calls me Bunty, it's a silly name, but anyway, where does Bunty live? And my grandson said to his six-year-old friend, she doesn't live anywhere. She's an explorer. <laughs> um, 
I thought that was rather sweet, and actually that, and that really resonates with Thomas Machel because one of the themes of the book, the book, as you'll hear, it's a story about a life, and it's a story about a search, all sorts of things, uh, and it's a story. People say it's a page-turner when they read it. They want to know what's going to happen, but of course, like so many books, there's other underlying themes that you can pick up or not, but very clear in this one is what is home because just like the artist here, he forced himself away from home. He didn't have to, he could have had a com comfortable life. Um, and instead, he chose to go away from home. And then when he goes back into what was home, he doesn't feel at home because he's been in the East and he's back in Northern England um, where nobody understands where he's been. And then he says, he, he's absolutely between East and West and he doesn't feel quite comfortable in either and loves both. So that's one of the themes. And now, of course, I've lost the pointer, haven't I? Um, where did I put it? No idea. Um, so I will carry on if you could find me the pointer. So Thomas Machel, is it down there? So this young man, I was led to um, by one word, indigo. There we are. That's the trouble with putting textiles all over the podium. You then can't <laughs> find the bits you need. Um, I spent, I, I lived just as a background to how I found this book. The work, I had to do about 20 years in Indigo in order to find the diaries of this young man because I was led to his journals by the word Indigo. Um, and the journals look like the picture on the right. Um, and I'd been writing diaries since I was seven. You know, they're, they're so embarrassing when you look at them. That's another thing, you know, it's like, what is you? Because I read this diary I wrote when I was at school. It's all lovelorn. I fell in love with a pop singer who was ancient and of course had to get rid of me. Um, because, well, I mean, he was 18 and I was 14. It's ancient for that gap at that time. I was a silly teenager, he was going to university. Um, he became a famous singer later. <laughs> um, and, you know, silly letters like that. And, and then, um, you know, it doesn't seem like me anymore. You know, I feel a, another me altogether. So these diaries are an extraordinary record of time. And Thomas Machel was a compulsive diary writer. Uh, and left, he actually wanted to be heard because he left the diaries. He bound his work up and left it um, at home. It ended up in the library and he wanted them found. But in his time, he was sidelined for various reasons, as you'll hear. Um, and so I did... I lived in the Middle East and I ended up by chance recording the work of the last indigo dyes in the Arab world. It wasn't in my intention, I, wanted, I was a batik artist at that time, but my life went another way. Um, eventually it became a PhD, that wasn't my plan either. Um, and then that was published, Indigo in the Arab World, the most boring covered book in the entire world. <laughs> Um, they forgot to tell me it was republished recently. Uh, it's on Kindle and all that, but it's very dense. It's because it's, it's, it's about Indigo and the Arab world. Um, and then that led to being commissioned to write a book on Indigo worldwide. And when I was asked to do this by the British Museum, I said, I can't possibly, it needs multiple authors. And they said, oh no, we don't like multiple authors because they always argue with each other. <laughs> um, I felt, I remember feeling physically sick, certain times in my life when you feel physically sick about something, signing the contract for that book was one. Um, but it meant I could compare across cultures, which I love doing, you know, the botany. How do they make a dive at in, in, in Ecuador compared to an island in Indonesia? What in, they're doing the same chemistry, but different ingredients, different plants, and so on, and the techniques. Anyway, we're not talking about indigo too much today. Um, but somebody at in 1999, the librarian at my university went up to, um, which is Exeter, away from, to London for a librarian's meeting. And there were showcases on display. And in one was a page open from these diaries of Thomas Machel. Um, and the, it was indigo planters after Tiffin, which you'll see in a minute. And the label said, um, five volumes of an indigo planter and midshipman in the mid-19th century. That's all. And so the librarian came home early in 1999 and um, said to me, phoned me up and said, there's some, a man manuscript, did you know, in the British Library of this young indigo planter? And I said, no, I didn't, but I've changed my life. I've done two books. I'm not going to do any more. Um, thanks for telling me. And I wrote down the class, and that was all. No November 1999, I was in London for other reasons. I thought, I'll just go and look at those um, for half an hour. I had to order them in advance because they're in a special room because they're a manuscript. There are five volumes, that each one is 3,000, uh, the whole lot is 3,000 pages. 
and I had about half an hour, and I opened one up. I saw some rather quirky watercolors there, uh, and I saw this voice. Thank God I could read it, because I couldn't have done my work if it had been illegible, like his boss's letters are. Uh, and he, I, literally, after 3,000 pages, I opened one up, and it said, um, who would have thought that Indigo would have given me a career and a chance to travel and meet people? And I thought, oh, no. <laughs> so <laughs> I shut that up, and I opened another one. <laughs> so, the next one I opened said, I wonder if somebody will find these in a dusty library in the 20th century. And <laughs> I literally wrote that in 1848 on a plantation in Bengal, imagining somebody finding them in a library in the next century. That was his sense of time um, and waiting for them to be found. I really, that's another moment. Well, I actually remember feeling sick to the gut because I shut them up. I did not want to know about them. Um, but I was doing, actually doing, I was, thought I'd do something more useful than what I thought I'd been doing, so I was training to do adult literacy in prisons and things, can you believe, um, to do something sort of more practically useful. And I never finished the training because I went out to India uh, two months later. I was going anyway, I changed the entire program, thought, why don't I just go and see if there's any indigo plantations left of Thomas Machel. Um, it, and, of course, the border had come down, as you'll see in a minute, and it was Bangladesh and West Bengal now. Quite hard to get to. In fact, we were told not to go because it was on the... Um, there's a lot of smuggling on that border. We had to pretend we weren't going there to get the visa. Um, and anyway, off I went, and then I have met in Bangladesh somebody I've been corresponding with, uh, Bangladeshi, for, since the 80s, when nobody was interested in indigo and revivals then. She was unique in reviving indigo very early in Bangladesh, before the trend that's happening now, um, Ruby Khaznavi. Um, and I came the other side, and there's too much of a story here, but I just, through a friend of a friend, had just met Amrita Mukherjee's in the audience for the first time, She'd been given a book that morning called Indigo by uh, the, the great um, filmmaker Satyajit Ray, who'd written a book just published in English, his st short stories, first one's Indigo. I turn up in the afternoon to, to have drinks with this unknown lady, uh, and I take my book, Indigo. So she was given two books on Indigo on the same day. We went off to Bangladesh, came back, phoned her up and said, hello, I'm Rita, we're back in Calcutta, we're going to look at plantations. We've had all our luggage stolen, by the way. It was rather a bad <laughs> experience on the border, as we've been warned. Uh, and she said, I'm coming with you. And off we went. <laughs> with Amrita, it made all the difference. And 17 years later, we ran an event in Calcutta, um, focusing entirely on indigo, last November. Uh, and I've been back to Bengal again and again, and she's here today. So isn't that amazing? Right, so we'll look at some pictures now. Um, keep an eye. Am I allowed to, because it started late, am I allowed to end late? Is my, okay? Nobody's, well, you can all, you just slip off if you need to go. I feel I lost 10 minutes, so I'm going to keep them. <laughs> so this is how it started with me. Actually, it started, well, you can't, as usual thing, where does it start? What really started was living in the Middle East. And again, this destiny about where you go. I went on a hippie trail, actually, <laughs> to uh, probably still look it, don't I? Um, <laughs> I must sort of do something about my hair and my clothes. Um, so I went on a hippie trail to India and um, got completely hooked and thought, after university, I'm going to go back east because I, I wanted to get to India and beyond. I went to Sri Lanka too. It was Ceylon in those days with their elections happening. Oh, is that because I'm waving this around? Um, and anyway, I came back and did my degree and I took a job in, I had a job in Thailand that fell through and I ended up through incredible serendipity um, taking a job in the Middle East. Uh, and I knew nothing about the Arab world, and I actually wasn't interested. So my destiny was forcing me to a part of the world that wasn't where I wanted to go. And how amazing that turned out to be. Um, and look what's happened to the countries now. And so I had this whole life in the Arab world with my boss, who, reader, I married him, as Jane Austen, I think, said. Um, uh, yes, older than me, an amazingly wonderful man, archaeologist, poet, Arabist, writer. Um, in the Foreign Office because he needed a sensible job, but that wasn't his persona, let's say. Um, and we had the most amazing time because he was an incredible traveler. And without him, none of this would have happened. So um, we came back to England and I started my life um, as, as a dyer in this courtyard. But my husband was putting up an exhibition about Yemeni, um, about Yemen, the two Yemens. Look what's happened now for our university. I um, had to set up a little exhibition, just an amateur one, not like this, and I hung up an indigo dress. 
Su I phoned Susan, my mentor on the left, and said, you must come and see this amazing textiles. We stood in front of a burnished indigo dress, and she said, Jenny, um, somebody needs to go and record that in case of future revivals and because it's not been recorded. And I thought, I can see the point of recording it, but there will never be revivals, never. And actually, how wrong I was. There are revivals everywhere, and that's what I'm working with now most of my time. Amazing, the difference. Um, and uh, who was to know what was going to happen to Yemen as well? And she got me a grant. I didn't want to go, but she, somebody gave me a grant, so I had to go. And thus the whole path started, which led to Thomas Machel, really in this courtyard in my first indigo dive at. Oh, whoops. How does this work? Yeah. Uh, so I found myself in Yemen in 1983. So we'll just whiz through these and then get to Thomas. Uh, uh, half of these have been bombed now since I took this picture. I mean, it's too heartbreaking. And I think part of my destiny being in the Arab world, funnily enough, was uh, I collected things, I recorded things. I say I ended up recording the work of the dyers. I was given amazing blocks and blo from block printers sitting under a tree near Aleppo, uh, Syria, all these places, not knowing what the future was holding. And uh, if anybody's interested, the collection that I collected, I'm not a collector, but you know, if you travel, you can't resist buying something, can you, as a, a one-off. I'm not, not, I'm not a collector in that sense. Uh, I've just donated it all to the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, and it's been worked on kind of tragically but positively in another way, and reinterpreted by refugees in UK. So that's how life changes unexpectedly. And sadly, but at least the culture is something positive that, that carries on. So that was an amazing uh, trip, and um, I went to this wonderful town, which is right near Hodeida, the center of the bombing at the moment, uh, and found the last, very last dyes of indigo. I'll bet that not, that's not going on at the moment, but maybe it'll revive when peace comes. And this is what got me hooked on indigo and why I'm now here today on that entire path, which I wasn't expecting. Uh, and then I c came incredibly fascinated by the, I wasn't going to do anything with it, but I gave a lecture and somebody said, you have to do more. So it became the whole Arab world, including North Africa down to Mauritania, and then that became the PhD, et cetera, et cetera, as I've mentioned. And I've discovered that this extraordinary dye, which I'm not going to go into, it is the only natural blue dye in the world. Um, there are, so until the time of synthetic dyes in, in the 19th century, on the case of uh, indigo, not till 1900, Everything that was dyed blue came from indigo. So all these words we use, blue collar worker, royal blue, navy blue, you name it, anything is indigo. It dyes every fiber, it has a unique chemistry, unlike the other dyes, it dyes cool, it's perfect batik, everything about it's extraordinary. It's even a pigment anyway, in a certain form. I've got a lump here. It's called indigo because it was traded to Europe um, 2,000 years ago, uh, a substance from India extracted from the green leaves of a plant by an amazing process, you end up with a rock-hard stone. They thought it was a stone. It's actually a vegetable pigment. You can paint with this or you dissolve it right back again and reverse the whole process you've used to make this. You reverse it and make it not blue again in a dye vat and then dye with it. And when you dye with indigo and pull the cloth out, the cloth has to be not blue and the oxygen turns it blue. I mean, this is a really, it's a most magical dye and nothing else behaves like that. So even when it was synthesized, um, so synthetic indigo is what's used for most of the billions of pairs of jeans made today. I'm going to change that though. <laughs> it's coming. Levi's are starting to use natural indigo. Denim is being made in thousands of meterage now in India for Levi's and so on. It's coming. Um, because synthetic indigo is the same chemistry, but it pollutes all the rivers. Whereas this is a green crop, the pl plant that produces this, and it's a buffer crop between rice. It doesn't take up extra land. It is the most perfect um, uh, commodity for um, uh, sustainability and returning to natural dyes is the indigo, the color of the dye for jeans. And in Levi's factory, the same amazing process happens. The yarn has to go yellow, blue, yellow, blue. It has to oxidize. The same thing happens. Only I say it, it pollutes the rivers of China, whereas this fertilizes the rice fields. So, uh, and it's so ancient. There it is for blue on the left. Um, Maya blue is indigo blue. Um, it dies, as I say, linen, and so 6,200 6, years ago was the earliest use known so far, but that's a new discovery. So it's an amazing thing, and there it is used for a paint um, on an old um, manuscript map. 
So sometimes I work with something like the Bodleian Library and we're just making indigo paint. It's so, so exciting. <laughs> Um, the oldest representation of blue jeans. Another thing about indigo, which is extraordinary, and it does link, this is linked, because Thomas was fascinated by indigo, as a chemi as a, the chemical process, alchemy, it's absolutely magical. Uh, and look here, every other archaeological dye, every other dye changes color over time. You have to analyze to see what they are. That's Armenian cochineal, actually, and the yellow, it was yellow, it's faded. Look at the blues. He's chosen blue because it strengthens the fibers and it's practical. They literally are blue jeans for, um, what's it, 4th century BC or 5th. I'm not going to look at that. Um, and so I then ended up going to amazing places, China and so on, looking at all the processes, techniques, dye vats and everything. Such a, people thought I'd chosen indigo because I love traveling. They said, you just want an excuse to travel. <laughs> and it wasn't like that, actually, but it was marvelous. <laughs> I'm not complaining, but indigo chose me. Um, for some reason, maybe for Thomas Machel. West Africa, amazing tradition. Uh, indigo has, has this history, uh, which is over 6,000 years, as we've just seen. And it's, I always see it visually, like a sort of, it's this beautiful blue, it reflects, it reflects the color of the blue planet. All the founding myths about indigo is how do you get this color of the sky and the sea and so on into cloth? And you get everything from the palest blue, all the shades, as that poem says, from indigo, right to almost black. Um, but because it's so amazing and it was so vastly needed um, to dye uniforms in the West and so on, it has an association with slavery or forced labor in India at a period of its time, well, in the colonial period. So it was one of the colonial crops being grown um, in the West Indies and the southern states of America. So it has an association with um, slavery in certain parts of the world and also with Bengal, while it was being used everywhere, all over the world, for, for beautiful textiles for thousands of years. And this particular cloth, I mention it here, because this cloth, to my sort of horror, really, I was asking about the designs on the right. Uh, the design with the closed loops is slave shackles, even on the cloth today, in Senegal. So well, one has to face up to that. But it's not indigo's fault. Indigo, it's the commodity. It was a, a commodity that was needed. Indigo is beautiful. Um, but it was a colonial commodity with an amazing history. And I have the most amazing day of my life, and we're just getting to Thomas now, was dying with indigo that I was sent from a shipwreck which sank in 1640. The indigo, therefore, be made probably in 1639 in Mexico. The ship sank and was recovered in, in 1980 and in 2007 when, in fact, as it happens, there was a lot going on marking the, the date of the year of the abolition, the at centenary, the abolition of the um, transatlantic slave trade, um, I was sent some indigo from the shipwreck and I did a dye sample with it and it was an extraordinary thing to be using indigo made under those conditions nearly 400 years ago and dying, look at it, it was just like jeans today, the indigo is 400 years old. Uh, and this is another example, this is in Kew Gardens for the colonial exhibition in 1886, uh, when, the, when, the, when the colonial story moved from after the American War of Independence and the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade, where was indigo going to come from then? Great consternation um, for the whole world's indigo. It's the, the story shifted back to India, the home of indigo, and um, Bengal became where half the, uh, half the commodities through Calcutta in the 1850s were indigo. It was that important. Uh, and again, very exploitative, a very bad system. And in 1859, there was a mutiny against an uprising, and indigo then moved to Bihar. And then Gandhi used that story for the first move to independence. So indigo has a whole political story at that time. And Thomas Machel's right in the middle of this and aware of it and foresees the mutiny. And this is the system. Um, so here we get to Thomas Machel. So we had an exhibition in 2007 in UK, incredibly popular show on indigo. We had the, we had the um, model in the middle of it and beautiful textiles. Uh, and rather, I think this is unfortunately Howie jeans. There's a now a great return to natural indigo. Howie jeans, they call them plantation jeans, which I think uh, the word plantation has a connotation in itself, doesn't it? Because it reminds one of plantations, uh, colonial plantations. Um, so, Thomas Machel, as I say, he had no intention of working in indigo, but he was right in there, and that was uh, just a part of his life. This is this young man, very unique. 
uh, unusual young man for his time, um, born with a birth defect, told he shouldn't travel. So he ran away from home at 12. And his eight-year-old brother, who was always a thorn in his side, did everything right while he did everything wrong in the sort of society's eyes, um, insisted on coming with him, or otherwise they'd tell father. So the two boys, they went the whole length of England, Thomas with his disability, whatever it was, uh, and the eight-year-old. And then when they got to the coast, Thomas couldn't then jump on a ship as planned because his blasted brother was in tow. So they went, they eventually contacted their parents after three weeks. And it's it's an, a chapter in the book. Um, and home they go, and his father says, you're not suitable for travel, but I can't stop you, clearly. You can be a midshipman in the Merchant Navy. And such, so his life started. And this is him, his selfie. Um, I've no doubt that if there'd been Instagram, uh, you know, emails, texting, what he would have used all of them, because he's a tremendous communicator. The journals are very unusual, actually, because they're written to his father. So that's another sort of thing about the book, is you know, the nature of journal writing. Are they truthful, even when, they, or even when they're personal? Are you thinking they're going to be read? You know, is it, how truthful is a journal? Um, what truth was anything? What is truth? Well, God, that's a big question now with um, <laughs> fake news and everything. Uh, and these journals are very personal, but they're written to father and written to posterity, clearly, because are they going to be found in the next century in a library? So, but they're also very, very emotional sometimes, so it's very interesting, and they write, they write, they're written to you. So when I first read them, he says, you know, um, I hope, are you going to find them? And, and I wish you were here. Can you hear the jackals? Can you hear them? And I'll say at this point, the journal, they're very unusual. They actually are magic realism, but the, well, that wasn't termed until 1970 on academic campuses. He does magic realism all the time, in that he's saying, today we did the planting, blah, blah, blah. And then he says, um, uh, this guy over there is doing that. Um, he's fallen asleep. He's dreaming of this. That's the empathy in the journals. He's going into, he's noticing other people as a total outsider and imagining what they're thinking. He's extending the writing all the time. Uh, and then coming back to commenting on the Crimea war or whatever's going on. You've, you're going through this stream of consciousness. It's very modern, actually. Um, too modern for the time, probably. And he did an amazing journey you'll hear about, uh, dressed as an Arab, taken as an Arab in every country um, uh, with his big black, he's very puny, he says, born with this very physically unimportant. But it was great traveling with Arabs because the one asset he had was this wonderful black beard which everybody admired in the Arab world. And I couldn't have done what he did because you had to be dark. He was taken as an Arab everywhere um, he went. His shipmates knew he wasn't, obviously. Uh, and that's the only portrait of him. Um, and this is the painting that led me to him, Indigo Planters After Tiffin. He keeps saying he can't paint. He hasn't got a camera. If he'd had a camera, he'd not, he would not have painted because he says, I'm a bad painter. But the sketches are just, to, he wants to show what, what, you know, they're records. They're like with the snaps we take on the mobiles. They're not, you know, we're not like being hugely professional. He's just saying this is what it looks like. So this, really, he's only 20 something. Already, he's painting a painting with such empathy. Can you see the um, perspective? So this is two planters. He's on the right, and his boss is on the left. It's his first job in Indigo. Can you see the line coming down? What perspective he's chosen to paint that picture of himself in as? The clue is the line down the middle. He's imagining what they look like under the fan to the man pulling the fan. There's no lowlier job, probably, than pulling the punker over the British sitting there to fan them. So he's, so he's imagining, you know, rather how comically, how ridiculous they look to the, little, to the man there who's paid nothing and nobody notices. He notices everything. Uh, so that sort of, I didn't notice myself when I first saw it. I thought later, that's the perspective of the punker waller. That's what that cord's doing coming down through the diary. Um, so very quickly, because of, I want to move on to his, okay. Um, so he, he could have stayed here. He was christened in this wonderful minster in northern England, where I went to university, by the way. Um, oops. Um, brought up in rectories and lovely houses, and his destiny was to push a quill in an office in this lovely Georgian town. There was no need for him to travel whatsoever. Very comfortable, lovely life with all the family around him. Um, that's the church which he, his father was vicar of all the time he was traveling, and his one memory. Every Sunday he marks in his diary, and when he's on by sea as well, uh, he thinks of father, who he's always trying to 
Um, he thinks he's, he's a failure in his father's eyes um, because his brothers are in the army or they're in the church or they marry well and all that kind of thing. He doesn't marry and um, he's, yeah, he definitely feels the sort of outsider. Um, and that's a memorial window to his mother who died when he was away at sea. Uh, and this is York Minster, where his, yes, his, the brother who did so well was canon here. And I, this is my university, and I, my, I was university in York, and I actually did a whole um, part of my degree on the stained glass windows, which he would have known very well. Uh, so off he goes, I say, at 16, um, in the Merchant Navy, hugely teased, I'm sure. Um, he talks about the, bully, but the bullies. He's just coded writing here. You can imagine what it was like to be disabled and 16 and a sort of runt <laughs> uh, on a ship full of um, experienced sailors. Uh, very tough. Got to Calcutta in the merchant ship. In fact, one of the commodities was um, they were collecting was going to be indigo, and something happened. The opium wars, so-called, these dastardly wars, which um, Amitav Ghosh says they're just as important in this part of the world we all learn about you know, the French Revolution and things in the West uh, and other important, but the, I mean, the, the opium wars are still underpinning um, just as the, actually the, in Bengal, the blue mutiny and the, the um, uprising in India in 1857, it's still there in the psyche. And these um, terrible wars when the British forced um, opium on the Chinese are very much in this part of the world, you're still aware of that uh, relationship. Uh, Amitav Ghosh is very interesting about this. So he's there in Calcutta, expecting to come home with some commodities, and the war's about to start. His ship becomes a troop ship. So from age 16 to 19, he sees the entire Opium War. You, I could have written a whole book. There's only one chapter in the book, but one could have done a whole book on this because he describes it in huge detail. He's rowing troops ashore. He's very minor. Uh, he's seeing everything, painting and um, saying that war turns man into devils. Uh, watching, he's a pacifist, and he sees the terrible kill, killings, but also um, he paints the people in the margins and what they're wearing and so on. He sees Hong Kong as a fishing village. He sees this right up to the end, the signing of the treaty in Nanking, his ship becomes a hospital ship, he gets malaria and everything else on the ship. I mean, that three years is a real growing up rite of passage for this young man, this naive young teenager with romantic dreams of travel. He saw this horrendous war and nearly died. Uh, he saw Hong Kong, as a, and he saw the beginning of the colonialism there. Hong Kong is a village, and when he came back two and a half years later, having watched the treaty being signed, Hong Kong was already full of all the nations of the world. Wonderful descriptions in the diary uh, from every country. Godown's being built just in two and a half years. Um, and this is the ship he, there, he lived in, therefore, for three and a half years. The 20th of December, 1840, is a memorable day in my life, the day I commenced a new era, and this is when all his adventures start from age 16. So, uh, I, and mine as a teenager was overland on the hippie trail. How privileged was I to see the, the Buddhas of Bamiyan um, when they were still standing before the Taliban blew them up. The Land Rover was my equivalent of the Worcester. Uh, and look, I just put that, isn't that classic? You could tell what date that was without looking at it. And being bloody-minded like Thomas, I left my fellow people. I didn't know them before I left anyway, and I spent six weeks with this nice group. Um, and I then went south and spent four months alone after that, wandering around southern India. Uh, and these are his first sketches, therefore. This was done when he got back. He did sketches and then did these later, but all the other diaries are done at the time. They're not so sort of dolled up later. And I then went in his footsteps later. I should say, one of the things about the diaries was that when I found them at the stage of my life, I found I had, when I returned from that first journey in his footsteps, I had actually been in his footsteps all my life without knowing it. So when I launched off back into his footsteps, I used to grab my own diaries because I'd been there on a coffee plantation when I was 18, for instance, five miles from his coffee, where he was opening up coffee and it was just closing when I went. Um, many places in the Arab world, the India journey, uh, Southwest China, um, I'd, I'd been to these places um, without knowing I was in his footsteps. So I was in my in own footsteps when I went back for the third time. So that's um, Amoy. Um, and these are the kind of journal entries for the during the Opium Wars. He's not just painting soldiers, he's painting all their what everybody's wearing. Uh, so they're like quite neat, these, because these were done from his notes when he got back home. Um, uh, this is a, uh, looks odd, it's a spread from the book. And what did turn out, oddly, um, was... Oh, is that the, where's the pointer, that one? Oh, no, oh, no, I've turned it off. There we go. I can't find the pointer. It's there, is it? 
I'll just point. <laughs> so um, when I was in China in the, again, I just sketch for the record. I'm not a great artist, obviously. Um, I was sketching people in indigo in little boats. And then I found the journal six years later, and he, he was doing these sketches. Um, quite similar sort of style. And the same thing here. There was his Chinese ones. He's better than me. Um, and these were ones I did from the bus. But we both had that same uh, extra thing, which is nice when you're writing to have the sketches as well. Uh, so that was an amazing episode. So the next one, I'm really short. So he comes home. He's at 19. He's been through all that. Uh, and then he comes back, and then he, his mother has died when he's 17. He doesn't know. It's very sad at home. And of course, by then, home isn't home, because he's been through all that, and the family don't know any of that. Uh, and so that's the first time he feels that he can't stay in England. And he wants to learn to sail properly, because he didn't learn anything as a midshipman his father had painted, for, paid for. And he sails before the mast on a little collier, tiny ship, taking coal to the most remote archipelago on Earth, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. The French had just conquered the Marquesas Islands from Tahiti. They were building little, they had little ships that were steamship, but steam couldn't go across the ocean. It had to be sail then. So they sailed for six months, halfway around the world, with coal to fuel the steamships in the Marquesas. How amazing is that? Incredible voyage, which we're going to skip over. But the important thing about this was that, incredible, it's an amazing record as well. He had his only an, or major love affair there, because it didn't matter that he was, um, had a limp and so on. You know, it was a whole attitude, different attitude to sort of sex and passion, let's say. And he had a passionately wonderful affair with a cannibal chief's daughter. So he was going to have an affair. He might as well do, the, do it properly. And amazingly, I think, the cannibal chief, his three sons had been killed by the French. He hated Westerners, and yet he took this young man to his heart who went up every evening up into the woods, sat with the man smoking pipe with the cannibal chief and the family. Um, and in fact, they said, stay here and stay with us and, you know, don't go. He nearly stayed. Um, and he learned the language in that time. So again, he was already doing something different. How he was accepted, you know, and not just killed straight away as a Western, I have no idea. But he had this wonderful beauty and a wonderful love affair. Uh, and came back. This is the bay you come into. I went, that, this was something I did in his footsteps. I hadn't done before, by cargo ship, because there's no flights there. Um, and this was the cargo ship we went on. Um, my husband was with me on many of these trips. Uh, and this is the, oh, that's the sailor I fell in love with, Marquesan, of course. Well, everybody fell in love with this. I mean, they're so beautiful with their incredible tattoos. You can't not. And we used to get into whaling boats and wade ashore. It was a great adventure. And when they left the islands, they had to fill the ship with ballast, which was stones, because there's nothing to collect there. And then when they got to the west coast of Africa, um, they ditched the stones and picked up guano, which was the absolute you know, bird shit, <laughs> um, actually. It was the fertilizer of the day, huge rush. It was like a gold rush for this bird droppings, which filled the caverns and was the first fertilizer in Europe when we were depleting the soils. That's how far back it goes, depletion of the soils. So the ship had four tons of um, stinking guano and two, re and two missionaries they had to rescue. And he's very comical about this. And they nearly sank in the Straits of Magellan and all that kind of thing. It's a tremendous adventure, that one. Um, but, uh, and there's the tattooed sailors. You couldn't, they weren't allowed to photograph them, we were allowed to paint them, which was great. So that suited me fine. And um, that's our ship down there. It's not at all like a normal South Sea island. As you see, it's volcanic and very wild. And very biting insects, which puts tourists off, which is great. And that's supposed to be the most beautiful bay in the world, on Fatuhiva, the most remote island, where Torheadal um, lived and it made all his wrong theories about um, which way um, influences went. Uh, America and Polynesia, since disproved by DNA testing. Um, so I, I, I love the these. So underlying well, the story is a story in the book, but underlying it is that I love the commodities and what's going on, the historical period of the time, and the amazing period of changing from the technology changing. It's very like what we've had the last, what I've been living through, you know, change to digital and everything. In fact, I just hadn't only just thought of this, you know, when I was, because I was growing up with, you know, pen and ink and typewriters and all that, and now everything's digital and so on. What a vast change. Uh, and it's the same thing for him. They were changing from steam to steam, uh, sail to steam in his lifetime. The um, first railways are being built in India. He went on several of them, they're kind of 10 miles long or something. He went on the first day. 
uh, and then, uh, and then um, cables and things were coming in. Um, he was really at that technological huge change. They found the, a cure for cholera that was killing absolutely everybody. Everything was happening at that mid-19th um, century period. It was one of those big changes technologically like we've had, uh, very tightly closed up. And I love all that in the book, you know, the description of the sailing ships and going on the first one that had a steam paddle and didn't work very well. So it took the steam paddle out and he does a drawing of the ship with the gap where the steam was uh, and that kind of thing. So then he goes to India again because he comes home again and it's nothing for him there. He, he, well, he can stay and push a quill in an office, but he doesn't want to because it's not home anymore. Off he goes back to India, which he says he'll never go back to again, but of course he does and ends up there. And in, in the diaries, he says, India is the land of my destiny. Uh, and lands here in Babu Ghat just been built. And then starts these amazing diaries, which are written in situ, and he has time. He doesn't want to go pig sticking. He won't shoot anything. He's vegetarian, I think. Uh, he doesn't like the fellow planters. He says they're awful, most of them, especially the Scots. And actually, my, I'm half Scots. <laughs> they were particularly exploitative. He really lays into the names of some of them in the diaries and how bad they were and how bad to the workers. And should he stay in this profession and um, try and mitigate the awfulness, or should he leave? He grapples in the diary with his conscience. If we go on like this, he says there'll be a mutiny. Um, he was well out of it by then, um, but there was indeed a mutiny, called, sort of known nickname is the Blue Mutiny against the white workers in um, 1859. And these are what the diaries start to become. He's starting to practice, learn Arabic and Hindi and Bengali. Uh, and soon, nobody in Calcutta will have him to stay, no Westerner, because he has Muslim friends staying with him, and so on. It's considered, as he calls it, infradig. Um, so he can only stay with Anglo-Indians, because his own fellow um, um, British will not have him in their houses anymore, except his boss, who's different. Um, so <laughs> the symbol of colonialism, I always think, um, in Calcutta. Um, and so this amazing journey, which we'll do really quickly. So when I went, I say, to Kolkata, which was really the sort of started me off, hooked in. Th th this is where all his indigo plantations are. That is the border of Bangladesh. So um, it meant going both sides, which was great for me. Uh, great, but difficult. Um, and this, is, this map, if you could see it close, there's only three in the world. Um, I want to raise millions of pounds. I want to raise money to buy this. It's so unique. It's still for sale. I want to give it to Q. Anybody feeling really rich here? Not millions, because it's, um, it, this was for the shareholders in London. And in fact, that map is absolutely covered with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of indigo factories. And if it's not indigo, it's sugar or, and then opium supported by the government. This is a very, um, it's a pretty exploitative and bad time from the point of view of British history, um, which we all know about. And so the, the, then I started trying to look for the old houses. A lot of them are gone. Or, for instance, this is with Amrita who's here. I mean, goodness, without Amrita, we'd never have found these places, that's for sure. So this is the house where his very first rather modest house, he, he, inside he painted that painting that led me to him. So imagine me being there with Amrita Mukherjee. She, I've never, we'd never, without her, we'd never have found them, I know. Finding the ruins and walking up these steps. By the end, we were mobbed by the entire village, of course. <laughs> and walking into the ruins of where the painting was made that had led me to him. On the right is the way the bosses lived. His boss lived like that, in these ridiculous sort of fake English mansions, so unsuitable for India. Mind you, they had marble floors and things, and big high ceilings. And trying to find that one meant that kind of journey at the bottom today. We found huge tanks in the jungle, um, but the house was gone. But the office are still there. Um, and this is the system. So just briefly, this is what it was like. Hundreds of these all over Bengal. Um, you bring the plant in, you soak it, you take the leaves out because the glucose has been split off the leaves. Uh, and then uh, the water has to be oxygenated. So people had to stand in these tanks and add oxygen. Oddly, in Tamil Nadu, where I'm going next month, uh, um, people, they, they do still do it by standing in the tank and kicking. Um, and that's not under a British exploitive system, that's just the way it's done, to add the oxygen. And then you collect the blue sludge, and then it gets boiled in a factory, and then you end up, and then you dry this blue clay, and you end up with what seems like a stone, amazing commodity for trade, uh, which is very low bulk and very high value. That was the secret of its success. And here's, he's the only one who did sort of personal 
um, descriptions like this. So you see he's not very good at drawing the people. They're quite comical, uh, but that's the whole system painted by him. Just keep an eye on the time. About 10 more minutes, do you think, Rahel? Know where she is. Yeah? Um, and then finding the old tank sometimes today, right near where Amrita Mukherjee lives, in, near Shantanaketan, in 2010. Uh, and then so, and finding the old, some of them were there still. This one was preserved because it's now a temple. Um, and the priest looked at Thomas, so I took the, his drawings back, and then the priest looked at the drawings and said, oh, he got that right, he's got the right number of columns. And then, of course, the all-important water. The whole system is fascinating. Um, in the book, the indigo is only two chapters, because the book is about... Um, well, it's about his life, but told through my search for him, which is not how I intended to write it originally. I'll tell you that just at the end. Um, and so wond wonderful records of, um, and in the book, well, there could have been an illustrated book, but um, I had some quite well-known people reading it, and they said, this is a read. D uh, I put the illustrations just in plates. It's something else to do an illustrated book. I wanted to do it like Winnie the Pooh, actually. I wanted illustrations all around the pages, like his diary. But I was told that it was, that it was a read, and, and not to, it was too complicated. I'm not sure I agree, but anyway, I think maybe I do. Uh, and then what sort of book was it? So there's in, illustrations in sections, and one day I'll, we'll get more illustrations out there. Look at his record of everything, and then going back was such fun in his footsteps with um, all my wonderful friends. Um, and all... All the other records, he's curious about everything, um, in musical instruments and so on. Uh, and then this is typical page. So when everybody else, all his fellow um, white Brits and so on, are off killing pigs and so on, he is going, being laughed at because he's going to local weddings and local puppet shows and things and is very highly teased for that. What on earth are you interested? Why do you go to a sort of native wedding in a village? Ridiculous. And when he's in the wedding, he says that it's, it's very embarrassing. I'm the sahib. Um, and he says, imagine me, I'm playing the magistrate. Age 23, he was a magistrate. He sees the ridiculousness of it. And he said, this woman prostrated herself. And he said, my dream is for women to have work. And through textiles, women should have more work and they shouldn't be bowing to the white man. And he's very conscious of all this, um, unusually. And he's the only known white man to have gone up into northern, what they, they call black Calcutta, and painted local houses, Indian houses, and so on. Um, so this made him, as I say, uh, an outsider. He forced himself to be an outsider, rather like it says here. He went out of, his, what they would say today, out of his comfort zone, um, which made him lonely and unhappy at times, but that was his destiny. And so that's on the right is a sort of sketchbook from my diary with dancers and things. Um, and he, wonderful descriptions of wildlife. And again, he's very conscious of this. So when he goes down and works in coffee later on, um, he says... Then, I mean, the whole of southern India was covered in forest, and he yet is mourning, cutting down big trees to, to put the coffee bushes in. He writes the most lyrical passage. I read it out to my husband. He thought it was a poem about um, cutting down the sandalwood that sh sheds, um, sheds a perfume on the axe that fells it. It's very poetical and beautiful. He's really feeling the cutting down the trees back then. Um, and one of the whole things about this young man is that he's far too ahead of his time. Um, you see, it's anticipation for the next century. And this is why he's unhappy, partly, because he's got this sensibility about nature, about killing animals and so on, which was not, at the time, was not, of course, accepted. And that's the Sunderbund and his description of the wildlife. And when you go there now in his footsteps and see how little there is, you really see um, uh, what, what we're doing to the planet, what we've done. Um, and then this journey, very quickly, this is one that moves me most. So he decides, he's, got to go, he's going to go home, um, and he's, it's boring going on British ships. He's learned Arabic by this time. He goes down to the docks in Calcutta, in, up into the Arab quarter, sits with the Arabs, that's their office, and books a passage home on a, on an, or by a series of Arabian dhows, shale, merchant sailing ships, but Arab ones. Dresses himself a la mogul, as he calls it. He says he looks much better like that in Arab clothes, because he's pretty ridiculous in Western clothes. Has his black beard, thank heaven. Speaks Arabic. Has the Bible in, in um, Arabic, because his uncle has sent him from Yorkshire, and gets on the boat with Arabs. Um, that's his captain. And travels with them for um, months at a time. Months. And is taken everywhere in caravans, arrives as an Arab. And... The reason he does this, so this is leaving, there's a zikr on the, uh, on the boat, and uh, that's him, that's the captain. Um, 
And he's quite proud of that drawing. In fact, his father puts a note on that one. Um, this is a very good likeness, he says. <laughs> um, Thomas Machel in Arab dress. He's ra rather proud of the drawing and proud of himself when he's dressed as an Arab. Uh, and I had to go to India in 2010, and I wanted, it was a challenge to see if I could go by cargo ship. I took the very last um, container ship. You can't do this now. There was one going um, once a month, and I went on it in 2010. It was, I didn't know I was going to be the only person when I got on. I was told there were going to be six others. I wouldn't have gone if I'd known. But, um, and it was amazing, and another woman got on later. And you can't do it now, and it was, that was the crew. And when we went to Pakistan already, um, passengers were forbidden, so we had to be deck scrubbers, cr crew at the bottom there. Um, it was an ad adventure. I got on in Southampton. That was the site for my... This is the site. I wasn't expecting this. Um, that's, that was my view. And I looked at the list. I wasn't really concentrating, as usual, when I book a trip. You know? And I, I thought, well, God, we're going to Muscat, we're doing this, we're going to... Amazing sort of romantic places we're going to. I didn't realize the container ports are 50 miles from the old ports. You never get off the blasted ship anyway, because it's so expensive in port that they do it really quickly, the cargo, and they can't be bothered with you. So when you arrive, you go to the office and say, yeah, can I get a shore pass? Oh, shut up, you know, because they don't care about the one passenger who's in the way. They're really busy. And half the unloading was done. Also, I didn't realize we were going up to the North Sea first, because I wanted to go from Southampton to Mumbai. And I sort of failed to notice that the first week was Southampton up to Hamburg and Rotterdam and everything. So the first week in January was in the North Sea um, in blizzards, unloading at night by floodlight to try and beat the blizzards and the icing up and everything else. And there was no heating except in, uh, up on the, um, in the bridge. Uh, oh, God. Anyway, um, my daughter said before I went, Mom, you're going to be the only woman, you know, with very rough crew. My, daughter, my son was so protective because he, he worked on um, cruise ships. Mum, I know about this, you know, they're very rough, these ports, you know, really be careful, you shouldn't be doing this. My daughter said, no makeup <laughs> and don't wash your hair. <laughs> and I was sitting on the bridge, you know, with about 10 clothes on, looking, you know, with a beanie on top, you know, and then we were going into these um, seamen's hostels with all the Russian crew freezing to death, you know. There was no question of, you know, it was terribly safe. It was great. <laughs> um, and the crew were great. They were Filipino and the East European, the um, Russians and R Ukraine. They were great. We had a Croatian captain who hated the British. It was to do with football. Um, <laughs> uh, it was a whole eye-opener. Being an, It was an eye-opener. And, it, uh, and um, anyway, so... And it, this was typical. I got to Sa Port Said, planned to meet my stepson who lived in Cairo. Did we get off the shop, n ship? No. And I had a moment there when I was fuming and thinking, this is awful. And then I thought, my late husband used to say, and I had this moment, one can, indeed one must, learn to turn disadvantages into advantages. He was much wiser than I was. Um, I'll never get to that kind of wisdom. But I had that moment then. I thought, you spend the whole of your life complaining you don't have time to draw and paint. You've got a day on the ship. Paint. So I went on the bridge, and that was the view down the Suez Canal over, of course, containers and cranes and things. That was what it was like for five weeks. Um, and then we went down the Suez Canal, and that was Thomas. I didn't realize also until I got on the ship that basically I was doing his journey in reverse and on the same dates, and I hadn't focused on that either. Um, and so he went into, did the same voyage, as I say, and so we, I had time to paint on the boat. And I might say at this point that I had dropped the journals in 2005 for many reasons. Um, we'll whiz through the last ones. Um, personal work, everything. I really didn't do much with them after. I did all the research before 2005. And I hadn't decided how to tackle them quite. Um, and all the writing, all the research was done. And stuff happened to me. And, I, and really this voyage, this slow voyage, was a sort of personal voyage as well. I photocopied a lot of his journals, this, all this journey, and after a week, I suddenly reconnected with him, and I wrote this chapter in, in, um, in real time, because how to write it was a thing. So this chapter is a series of entries written to Thomas, uh, and the whole book changed because of the time scale, actually, and I finished the book on this journey. And my plan was to finish the book on a plantation when I got to Bengal, um, like he did, because I was going to Bengal, as usual, for a conference, but actually somebody 
running the conference, which I'm Rita, it's called Sutra, which I'm Rita started, Sutra Textile Studies, um, was ill, and I became more involved than I expected in the conference running. Didn't go and sit in my little hut in Bengal, finishing it off. And it was much more appropriate to do what I did do, which was to write it a different way. I did emails to him then from Calcutta, because I wasn't going to go and sit quietly in a hut. So I thought, I'll bring him up to date and I'll email him. So the last chapter is emails to him. So just about to finish. So, um, so this was the kind of, well, anyway, so I just drew containers because there wasn't really anything else to draw much. Um, and we went through the pirate zone. It was all very exciting. And I put this on because um, this was the worst year for pirates. And we went on pirate watch the same night he did, uh, on January the 18th, but 150 years later. We were both on pirate watch. Whoops. Um, and this is the pirate. They were boarded by pirates. This was 2010. We could not land in one or two ports because something was happening in Yemen and so on. It was the very beginning of what we've got to now. It was just starting. Now, Thomas in his journals, so, uh, they, so the shipmates say, why are you interested in Islam? You know, you're a Christian, your father's a priest. You know, what's the point of this? And he says, we need to understand each other's religions. Otherwise, there'll be trouble in the future. And I'll tell you where the trouble will come from. It'll come from the extremists. It'll be the Wahhabists. Incredible. Um, that he talked about, and he said, we've got to educate and we've got to read each other's books and understand them. And this is why I'm partly doing this voyage. It was like a lone um, effort in religious tolerance. And if we listened, maybe things would be better. And he goes to Jeddah. Um, and I, we went, so I was not allowed to get off in Jeddah, was I? Because I was a woman unaccompanied. That made me furious at, at this, you know, uh, in the 21st century, actually. <laughs> And we've still got a long way to go for women's equality. Uh, and then he has a shave and all that. So, um, and paints, paints all the textiles in, in Egypt. Um, and does an amazing trip up the Indus, which I won't talk about. Um, so I only got to the Indus on the blasted ship, and we couldn't get off because we weren't allowed to be there in the first place. But he went right up the Indus, an amazing voyage, right up to the northwest frontier, where I had been at 18. And this is coming down the end, but just me feeling incredibly sad in the book about what's happening to um, the environment, because these c container ports are horrendous. I'm on the um, tw Twitter with the CMA, CGM <laughs> container ships, and they've just launched a new ship twice the size and a new port. I mean, it's just ghastly. Um, and then amazing trip. In, um, so he, he, when he goes to Cochin, he's dressed as an Arab and taken as an Arab by his English, and I went to, um, to the coffee plantations where he'd been. Another whole episode in coffee, which I'll just skip over here. Um, I'd been there when I was 18. Staying, ridiculous. I ended up staying with people I'd never met before. I was a hippie then, who turned out to be the most famous taxidermist in the whole of Asia. <laughs> so I walked into their house and it was like that. Um, and somebody wrote a book about them. They, they were total legends and hugely famous. I had no idea, I was 18. And um, they took me off to their coffee plantation, which was flowering. And then all those years later, 30 years later, I found their coffee plantation was about two miles from where Thomas had been opening up coffee uh, all that time before. So we had this coffee link as well. Uh, so um, this is all this coffee journey and go downs and things and, and being in his footsteps. Um, and this is his drawing and then what it's like today, very similar. Still with bullet carts in 1970. Um, and then another daft journey, because one thing about the book, I say I'm nearly going to finish, because, yeah, okay. Uh, one thing about the book is, um, is a, there's a mystery in the book, because he writes when he's traveling only, uh, and one other thing in the diary, he says, um, when I die, I will leave behind seven volumes of diaries. If you look at the other, the five that are there, they each cover really three years, amazingly sort of precise, as it turns out. He lived six years more. He lived seven volumes worth, but they're not there. And the last entry is, da is there on the coffee in 1856, just before the so-called mutiny uprising in India, where he had three members of family fighting Indians while he was, you know, all, had Indian friends. Imagine how tortured that made him. What happened to him those last six years? So one of the challenges, when I first f discovered this, I thought, oh no, you know, um, I'll never know, I wish there were diaries. But it became a tremendous challenge to, about what to find out and piece, piece it together. 
and it becomes part of the book is how I'm going to do it. And also, where was he buried? There was no record of a grave anywhere. So I did this dotty journey with my daughter to the middle of nowhere looking for the grave uh, in Sleeman, where Sleeman um, had his court and tried the thuggies, where thugs came from, supposedly. It's all very British view viewpoint. Um, and then, so that's another whole journey. So just bringing it back to, and one, one thing that happens in the book, what happened was this mythical house. He is Thomas Machel of Crackenthorpe. Uh, what is Crackenthorpe? Turns out the Machels of Crackenthorpe are the longest living family in Britain. Huge lineage going back to Roman times. But they lost the family house for 100 years in a gambling debt. And Thomas's younger brother, who was, and they're such characters, you know, they're not at all like a Victorian family. They had no money, and Thomas's younger brother became a gambler in his own right, and ran horses and became a horseman, completely unknown, and won loads of money and annoyed all the people who were in the know, and bought back the family home, but Thomas never knew it. But his diaries ended up there. Um, so I went on his behalf, as it were, to this extraordinary, um, um, extraordinary um, sort of mansion that was rather overgrown and rather spooky and has several ghosts um, in well-known ones. Um, and this is inside the house where I had a birthday party. I rented it. And then the story goes in two directions because um, one member of the family, most of the, the wars changed everything. So there's another thing with the First World War being commemorated. The First World War completely changed that family's history like so many. But the Machels moved to the New World because one of them became a theosophist. He was the most famous artist for the Theosophists, and on the Theosophist journal today, this is the painting, The Path. And he actually was a spiritual seeker, and it was because he read Thomas Machel's journals and was, became interested in the East and other religions like Thomas. He was that seeker. And so that's why the, American, the Machel descendants are heart surgeons and so on in Texas today. And this is doing research, uh, family research. And a box turned up in an attic, just when I needed it, in the attic of someone else's house, another story. Um, a dream. So we just go back to Calcutta to end, um, because it's very, there's a central thing about the destiny in India. Um, so when I first went to Calcutta, I, went, I took his maps with me and imagined being in his time, seeing it in today's eyes. One of the titles of the book that got rejected was um, Three Pairs of Eyes. Uh, and so, and then trying to find the old houses or not, you know, and all that kind of thing. Um, very footsteppy, but interesting. Uh, and then just going back to his pages. So not only, as I say, so this is, you know, so this is a typical page. Isn't it ridiculous, Dad? Here is me. I've got 15 servants, you know, and he says, I sit there alone eating my dinner. This is what I look like. It's another selfie. And this is my sweeper look. Look what, but it's a record of the textiles, and of course I'm a textile person. It's a unique record, very closely, of what they were actually wearing. And most people didn't paint what's, there's very few records actually of what sort of servants wore and, you know, village people wore, but his diaries are full of them. Wonderful um, record. Um, and that's another selfie, ridiculous, me going through the paddy fields collecting birds for my collection, which he sent to England. Uh, and then, oh, ridiculous, finding an old shop in Kolkata. Um, I've got a thing about that. These are on that table in that painting. It's a pity to fly because then you can't take things home. And then finding um, in Kolkata a, a colonial hat and thinking it was very like Thomas's. Uh, and so finally, um, and then it all came together. I mean, it's funny, this journey, you know, there's two things going on. One thing is the story in this book. Um, and then the other thing is leading to the indigo stuff. It's all interwoven, um, the two things. He would love what we're doing now with the revivals. Now, Marita's in the audience here, and all my Indian friends, Ruby, who started the project, Ratna, who works with disabled children using natural dyes, an amazing product. They're just up in Munna, of all places, in Kerala at the moment. Terrible times. And then we finally had this event, which was hugely successful. Um, and so I'm just going to, um, and well, we had an auction, um, the first one for over 100 years in Calcutta, and that's led to a, a major television channel noticing because it, it got into the UK Times business section headline the next day. And now I'm going with a television company next month um, to talk about the revival of Indigo. I mean, it's, so the, all this stuff is leading to something else. Um, 
Yeah, and then this is the, what is, I just put this in, this is the um, installation, if you go to Singapore until the end of September, this fantastic um, uh, Center for Contemporary Art in Singapore. This is a, a, a Mumbai artist doing this beautiful installation with indigo dyed jute. So um, he, he doesn't talk about history, it's abstract, but of course when I saw it I thought it was um, very reminiscent somehow hoping to get into London. And just a reminder that he's a, underneath all this is this spiritual seeker. Um, another journal turned up um, a couple of years ago in a sale room in New York. This was his notes about religion. Uh, and I always gave lectures. I always used to put Krishna on because he's the indigo god. Um, but it was only when I was speaking in Kolkata to a Bengali audience with a memorial, <laughs> Victoria Memorial behind him. It's such a funny mixture. Um, and the person interviewing me, who's a textile person, said, Jenny, if your book was translated, it would basically be called Krishna, because deeper than indigo, and deep indigo means Krishna. And I sort of never, he made that connection. Uh, so, um, so what was for me, just finally, um, so I'd written this book on commodity. I don't really like writing about myself, actually. I, uh, and it's the same with cameras, because someone the other day wanted a picture of me doing field work, which I did for 20 years or more. Not a single picture with, of me with the dyes, because I was the photographer. Um, and so the same thing, I, so I wrote about indigo in the Arab world, I wrote about indigo, I just wanted to get this recorded. But this book, so I started it thinking I was going to write his biography. But as I did the journeys, it became something else. And my main concern was to bring his voice out this time, because it wasn't last time, and it was so unusual. And it's not just me who says so, because the British Library has about over a mile of documents on India. <laughs> and I said, why did you spend all this money in 2000, it was about 15, 20 years ago, buying these journals? Because you know, they spent a lot of money on them. And they said, because it's a totally unique voice out of all the stuff we have. We don't have anyone like this, a sort of personal person with his quirky drawings and his personal viewpoint and his amazing writing. And they spent a lot of money on them. And they just waited for me to find them. Uh, but how was I going to bring him alive in the best way? And I realized when I did this ridiculous journey looking for his grave, I sat on the grave, which I, oh, I shouldn't have said this, it's a plot spoiler, and thought, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to have to be comfortable writing about myself because the journey looking for him and my old diaries and all the shifting time, which is in this gallery here, uh, and crossing times and space, it's part of the story and it would be far better to have this sort of, this approach. So actually the story begins literally when I, I meet him in the British Library. And I thought it was going to end neatly after 30 chapters when I'm back in Bengal, but something else happened right at the end, which dragged me back um, into something else. So the last chapter was very unexpected. And one of the themes of the writing is um, there were many chapters that got very good endings because I thought that was the end of the story. <laughs> and then something else would happen. And then I finally knew I had got to the end of this particular story, but it, it kept changing. So. Um, that's my excuse for writing about myself. It's not my memoir, because I don't write about anything that's not related to Thomas. It's not my whole life. It's the bits of my life that link with him. And then the search for him became the overall structure, because that was a thing. How to structure all this mass of material and mass of times? There had to be something that... So I always see it. This is my just final thing. Um, I see it like a skewer going through. So the skewer is um, the time scale. So it goes through his life, time-wise. Uh, but then there's a, like a rainbow over the top, and that is my search for him, which is in a different time. But throughout the book, you've got that thread. I think, uh, apparently it works. <laughs> when it went to first reader, I was worried, because um, it went to a rather well-known writer in the UK. And uh, I thought, here we go. And he said, you know, Jenny, what you've been saying, there could be an argument for starting with his death. I thought, oh, no. I thought, if he starts saying that, I'll never... I can't do it. In my head, it worked that way. And thank God when he read the manuscript, he said it worked that way because I think I would have abandoned it. I could not rewrite it in another time scale. It's rather like he's saying here, you have in your head these times that work. And it appears to work for the reader, thank heavens. Um, otherwise, the book would still be in a pile at home and ne never come out. And so th they all link, actually. But um, Deeper Than Indigo is probably the one that... I was led to with the other Gundigo work because there's something about it. 
But he's very involved in the revivals, I know that. It's what he would have wanted. And thank you for listening. Um, sorry, I went over time a bit. Um, and anyway, enjoy it to those who bought it. And um, sorry for going on too long. <laughs> <I've been>, bye. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. Um, we now have some time for questions. If anyone needs to go because I've been too long, please don't feel embarrassed about dashing off. I know that feeling in talks. <laughs> or if you want to come afterwards and talk to me. I know some people did. Well, okay, well, um, Jenny will be around for the... Oh, oh okay. Uh, I'll wait for the... Do you feel it's the hand of destiny that brought you to the books, or was it actually Thomas Maitrell? Oh, you mean a bigger destiny? Ah, oh, who can say? <laughs> that was what I tried not to be didactic in the book, actually, because I'm open-minded. I don't know. I mean, I have my personal feelings, and other people have different interpretations. Well, even, I just don't know. I just, but I do believe in serendipity, and one of the themes of the book is actually serendipity. Everything came at the right moment. Not before, not after. I needed to meet that person. Or there was an absolute unfolding about it. Um, and so, I mean, how that happened, I don't know. Is that because you're a writer and you're picking this stuff up? What is serendipity? You know, are you more open to stuff? Certainly the story, it wrote itself. I wasn't looking for it. I wasn't looking for the journals. I wasn't looking for the way it happened. And in a different order, it wouldn't have worked. The boxes in the attic turned up just to prove a point I'd already made, for instance. If I found them early, it would have been too soon. That kind of thing. So um, I felt a sense of compulsion. And when the book came out, and my daughter, I didn't see it. It went to my home. I was somewhere else, as usual. And um, I saw it in a text message. And I was walking on the cliffs, actually. And I just sort of shouted out. I, mean, I don't often do this. Um, I've done it. You're out there. Um, that his voice was not just sitting in a journal nobody was reading, that this book had to sink or swim now. For me, it was, it was for him. I felt that. Um, it's not about me, really. It's about him and his sensibility and what he's saying. But and it needed to be a good story. Who's going to read it if it's boring you know, and polemic? Nobody. It needed to be a good, readable story. So, um, but it's, it's about bringing his voice alive, really, and the, the stuff he's saying. So, uh, who knows? <laughs> I like the mystery, really. Yeah. And everybody has their own interpretation, don't they? Yes. Sorry? Did I find his grave? Well, I. Uh, that's a pot, plot spoiler. I did actually hint. But um, yeah, and I went right to the town nearby and looked at all the records. And I turned the page, you know, and there were hundreds there. And then, then it went over, and then his wasn't there. And then I went to the graveyard, and something else happened. Um, Yes, and that, it changed the book, actually, at that point. It was a completely dotty journey, but, um, yeah, you'll, you have to read that, actually. I, otherwise, if anybody's bought it, if I go anymore, they'll, it'll spoil that, because it does boil up to, am I going to find it or not? I certainly wasn't expecting to. <laughs> yes? You're clearly so interested in so many different topics, <laughs> and which is, has made this very entertaining. How did you stop yourself from chasing all these... Um, <laughs> Well, I don't really, as you see, but indigo's my skewer, because you're, it's right. I mean, when I was at school, if you go right back then, was I going to go to art college or university? I wanted to go to art college. The school said, oh, you know, they want everybody to go to university. It's better for the school. So I was forced into university, and then I enrolled in the art college, didn't I? And in the evenings, went to art college. and did manuscript illumination, funnily enough, given his journals and things, and other things, pottery. So I, mean, I was a bit of a, I did have all these, and I wanted to travel, I wanted to write, I wanted to paint, blah. but Indigo's given me that focus, so it all spins around the Indigo story. And I actually thought after this book I really was going to do something different. <laughs> but I've, re I've now relaxed. I'm too, in my life, it's too late. There's no point in my suddenly becoming something else. I might as well go with the flow which is always around indigo and continues to be so, and it'll probably until I die. I want everybody to, that's why I'm wearing red today, because I wear indigo always. And actually in my will, I think I've said to the children, wear red at my, <laughs> my poor family, you know. <laughs> Don't wear indigo, any of you, you know, just to piss me off. <laughs> um, because that has been the thing. And yeah, so um, 
thank heavens, without the indigo, I probably would have been a, a dilettante because I did have too many interests. Um, but it all, and then Thomas Machel, that, then he gave me the, that was another, he gave me, you know, the, I was interested, yeah, as you can get a bit the guano and Marquesa, but that then was Thomas's story, so that kept me focused. So actually having the writing has kept me focused, thank heavens. You're absolutely right, I'm a terrible, I'm, I'm a, what's the word, yeah, a dilettante in Monke or something. And then doing the PhD, I mean, I made, I forced myself, actually down something, I'm doing the PhD, I'm doing that book, I'm doing the Indigo book, I'm doing the Thomas book. So there's always that central thing I have to do. <laughs> and abandon the guano. And then you do the research, you know, you go in and out, and then back to the Indigo thread, or the Thomas thread. Yeah, it's a good question. It's really tricky. <laughs> I'm still here. <laughs> it's a bit exhausting sometimes. <laughs> but uh, who cares? I mean, you know, life's very short, isn't it? Mm. People say slow down, I think, why? actually. Um, I, I do. I mean, I, actually, I think slowing down is incredibly important. And you have to, everybody has their own methods. I don't think I need to... Uh, I, walk, I walk a lot. I walk and swim. And they're great. You know, swimming is meditative and walking the cliffs and things is... Yeah, that's what I do to sort of stop that. <laughs> or that. <laughs> yeah. Good question, though. <laughs> yes. The um, decorated initial in yes. Thomas's manuscript. Yes. Is that a one-off? And where did that come from? It oh, every, every new diary, he, he does a decorated in. He loves them. Every letter, he, all, all the pages of the new diaries, he starts with some lovely decorated initial. So where, he, he shares a love with I have a manuscript. My, in a past life, I think I was an Islamic calligrapher in Cairo doing manuscript illumination, but definitely in Arabic. That's why he likes the Arabic, because it's so beautiful. I'm going to Islamic Museum this afternoon. Um, so, oh, he loves doing those. He does them, lots of them. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and there's one, uh, there's one or two, but yeah, I mean, it's agony not actually having more illustrations out there in many ways, because um, you could do a whole illustrated book. Maybe another one. So we have time for one more question. Could you just tell us a little bit about what you'll be doing in television? What, what's the series about? Or what, what, what will the focus be well, there's a lot happening at the moment, which would be dear to Thomas's heart, um, and is what I'm now involved in. Is um, indigo is a fantastic metaphor for something else because everybody wears blue jeans for all ages, and I was working with a cellist called Yo-Yo Ma in New York in the in 2009 using Indigo as a project uh, with um, underserved schools, they call them there, school children in Harlem and things who were disengaged, because they all had blue jeans, and he felt Indigo was a connecting subject, you can do Indigo dyeing and so on. Um, and so the connecting fashion story is, is again denim, blue jeans, across the world. So it's like a metaphor for what's going on. So the bigger picture is fast fashion. So the oil industry we know is polluting, but the textile industry and fast fashion is a disaster for the world. But these things are so, they're such big stories, aren't they? Um, so if you have something like the indigo, which people, one can connect to, it's a real um, reflection of something bigger going on. So why are you buying 10 pairs of synthetically dyed um, jeans from, you know, in a cheap shop, which you keep for about, you know, why not have one pair of well-dyed jeans from the plant source? One is polluting and one is not. Uh, the rivers of China, as I say, I mean, they're, they're effluent there and things. Half of them, you know, a lot of them are from producing synthetic indigo. So uh, th there's a huge change going on in, in the psyche, and this is, what I'm, this is why I'm still in the indigo, really, because I really care about the environmental stuff, and it's, I say it's sort of almost a metaphor, a good way of doing it. Um, so yes, so there's especially especially the places that can grow indigo ferro, which is the nitrogen fixing one, the one in hot countries, this part of the world, which goes as a buffer crop with rice. It is feasible to do have a lot more indigo natural, and so the television programs are picking up on what's going on in the world. This story about slow fashion and indigo captivates because it's colourful and we all love it and so on, and we can relate to it. So I'm going out with the company. So we're going to go to where they're making the indigo at the moment in southern India. We're going to go to where they're making the organic denim for Levi's for their ranges, which are natural indigo, and which they're scaling up each year. They got scaled up the dye houses. They're scaling one up in Bali as well. Um, and then we're going to Kolkata to kind of look at the history and talk about the revivals that um, we're starting to do in, 
in Bengal. So that, that'll be the story. And Channel 4 News, they have, which was rather nice, also Thomas will approve of this, the foreign editor is, has, all, has been a male till recently. So people pitch their stories. They have the Channel 4 News, which is a very popular news station in the UK. And at the end, there's a nine-minute slot for in-depth something. And so normally, the, you know, the ma men go up and say they want to do their flak jacket stuff and stomp around war grounds, you know. But they've got a woman editor now, and she wanted more different stories, more something else. So it was a perfect moment. So the, this producer, um, who had read my book, read this one, you see, because of Thomas, um, pitched a story about going back and looking at Indigo today, and so she got the commission, so off we go next month. <laughs> and then that reaches how many more, that conversation, six million viewers. Uh, and again, I don't care, it's nothing to do with me. I mean, any, somebody's got, you know, I just happen to be the pivot in the middle. Um, that will reach millions of people. So of course I'm going to go, um, and of course I'm fascinated by it, um, because it, it's getting that story out there. Slow fashion is, uh, fast fashion is a disaster. A real desire. You read the figures of what happens, and it all goes back into into the sea, all the and the fibres and the. I mean, it's just impossible. Um, one of the biggest polluters of the planet at the moment is is buying far too many clothes and things. So we look. It's a it's an entire mindset. <laughs> and Indigo's in there somewhere. So that's yeah, a bit of a long answer, but I'm really passionate about this because I I really care. I mean, don't we all about what's happening to the planet? Mm. One more. Last one. And the children are the... I feel hope for the children. My grandson, I say, is six years old. He said, will David Attenborough be the most famous person in the world? They watch the Blue Planet. He draws pictures of sharks and David Attenborough in a, in a cap and everything, you know, in his cartoon, six-year-old way. They're very aware. The young are more aware, I think, than um, my profligate generation that caused this disaster in the first place. That's why I feel bad about it. Yes. Question? No. Yes. Oh, waiting for the mic. Can I ask uh, two technical questions? Technical, right. <laughs> well, yes. I mean, it's not strictly related to the book. But yeah, well, we got, we're we're on to, yeah, we got on to Indigo. He right. wouldn't mind. Okay. <laughs> what range of wavelengths in Angstrom defines the color Indigo? Uh, the wavelength. And number two, are there any, any dye, other dye material that's mixed with Indigo to produce, like, some other color. Because, yes. Because in, in the pictures, there were other colors. Absolutely. That was hanging. Okay. So, so yeah. we'd like to know a little bit more about that. Yeah. I mean, the reason the, so the three main dyes, or the main, the primary colors, red, yellow, and blue, were you know, lots of plants and things produced yellow before synthetics came along. And reds came from cochineal and madder and things. So they came from insects and plant world. Uh, and then the blue is indigo. So those were the three colors. Uh, and wavelength wise, if you look at uh, yellows, have got a, a wavelength that fades very quickly. So the way, that's why the yellows fade out. And they fade out. A medieval tapestry that had all the greens, that is the over dyeing. Um, so indigo has always been called the universal dye. It was the dye right across the board for the blues, including almost black, because actual black dyes were corrosive. They were made with tannic acid, gall nuts and things. And dyers knew that indigo, dark indigo mixed with some madder or something, which is nearly black, was a better black. So blacks were indigo. Um, purples were indigo and red because there's hardly any purple dyes in nature. They are lichens or shellfish. So nearly every purple was indigo and red. Um, there's no green dyes in nature. All the greens were indigo and yellow together. And you say, you look at the medieval, you go to v &A, go to the medieval tapestry hall, fabulous tapestries, all the foliage is blue. It wasn't, it was green. It was indigo and weld, yellow, uh, yellow. and the yellows faded up because the wavelength fades quicker. Um, blue is very stable actually, but not totally light fast. It's, it's a medium wavelength. Um, I'm not a physicist, but um, that, that's one of the secrets of its success. The other is its chemistry. I mean, its molecule is incredibly stable. It's got a beautiful molecule that chemists use as an example of a stable molecule. That's another. So its physics and its chemistry and so on is part of its global success and the reason it's used for blue genes and so on. It cannot lose its blueness. Um, it's always blue of some kind. So you fade and fade or rub and rub in your genes. They're always going to be blue, even if they go to pale sky blue. They will never lose it. That's, so that's all. It's a science story, and I'm not a scientist. I love being in conferences with scientists talking about wavelengths and you know, all their 
analysis they do these days and bouncing light off manuscripts and so on. Fantastic. I wish I was a scientist as well. Next life, I want to be a chemist. <laughs> So that's a, yeah, so it's an amazingly global story. Without the blue, without that indigo, the only blue, which is found in different plant species and different genera, by the way, woad in Europe, another plant in Japan, without that, there would have been no, amazing, without this double molecule, this indigo molecule, there'd be no blue dye. Extraordinary story, really. <laughs> Yeah, well, thank you for the questions, and thank you for listening for so long. And um, those of you who have bought the book, enjoy it, and those who haven't, I hope you enjoyed the talk, and thank you for coming. <laughs>